Hello and welcome to the third debate of Intelligence Squared Crypto, a new series from Intelligence Squared in partnership with Equinex. I'm Anne McElvoy from The Economist and tonight's debate is Crypto Can Bank the Unbanked. Before we begin, I'm going to ask you, the audience, to submit a pre-vote to get a sense of where your opinions lie. You'll know that we do this if you've attended previously, or even if you haven't, it's pretty simple. You vote for or against the motion, Crypto Can Bank the Unbanked, via the poll coming up on your screen. If you're unsure, you vote undecided. Just while that is being calculated, a reminder that our last debate was crypto versus the environment. And in a Twitter poll, we ran last week, 45% of people thought crypto was a threat to the environment. 44% thought it wasn't, that's finely balanced. And 11% were undecided. I would say across the series, that's a relatively low number of undecideds. So either the debate uh, swayed them or they were just people with very firm opinions. But you can catch up with the live audience results on the Intelligence Squared podcast. So tonight's debate couldn't be more timely. On Monday, September the 7th, El Salvador became the first country to accept Bitcoin as legal tender. Businesses there will be obliged where possible to accept digital coins as payment and citizens will be expected to download the government's new digital wallet app, which gives away $30 in Bitcoin to every citizen. Bitcoin fans have of course been jumping for joy about this. They believe the adoption of cryptocurrency in low income countries like El Salvador can provide banking services to 2 billion people around the world potentially who are unbanked. Let's take El Salvador there as an example. 70% of citizens unbanked, roughly a quarter of the working population lives in the US and sends remittance payments home to families. Well, in future, these payments could be made by Bitcoin, dramatically reducing cross-border fees and allowing families to send cryptocurrency straight to the mobile phone of their loved ones. But some security experts still have doubts. Banking the unbanked might sound like a bright idea, they say, but it assumes that people who lack financial services primarily need a better and a cheaper way to access them. A 2015 World Bank report found that 59% of survey respondents cited lack of money as the main reason for not having a bank account. So rather than luring people into the murky world of cryptocurrency, where volatile prices such as the recent drop in Bitcoin can make the poor poorer, should we not be looking instead at other solutions to bank the unbanked? That is the theme of our show tonight. Um, I am just going to read you the results of the first vote, and I'm very much hoping I get to see it because I can't quite see it at the moment, but that's probably my bad looking in the wrong place. Uh, actually, I can, I can, I can. I also realize I have a phone that needs to be dismissed, but we'll get rid of that in a minute. Crypto can bank the unbanked for 49% against 15%, undecided a whopping 36%. Goodness, gentlemen, all is to play wow. for. Our speakers are about <laughs> to, uh, to introduce 449 against 15, undecided is 36 there. So let's introduce our speakers and arguing for the motion this evening is Peter McCormack, journalist, investor, host of the hit podcast, What Bitcoin Did, in which he focuses on human rights, censorship and cryptocurrencies. He spent the last number of days in El Salvador and has previously met with the president there to discuss the adoption of Bitcoin in that country. Well, that clearly worked out, Peter. So, Peter, you are going to speak first for six minutes. Um, I'm reasonably strict about that. And then I will be passing over to Yaya Fanuzi, who is going to oppose you. I'll introduce Yaya properly when we've heard from Peter. But please take us away tonight on Banking the Unbanked. Yes, uh, thank you for having me here. I don't think I'm going to need six minutes, so I'll give uh, Yaya plenty more time for his side. Um, the, the debate is uh, whether crypto can bank the unbank. So just a couple of things. I'm going to focus uh, entirely on Bitcoin with my arguments, I, and uh, that's what my podcast does. I very, look at other, uh, very rarely look at other cryptocurrencies. So uh, the premise of the debate is can uh, crypto, I'm going to say Bitcoin, bank the unbanked? Well, it already is. So... If you look at what banking services are, it's the ability to hold, save money, and access financial services. 
well, applications that have been built uh, on top of the Bitcoin network are already providing these services to people who do not have bank accounts. Uh, I've seen it right here in El Salvador. I've met people who previously would not save money who've had access to Bitcoin and they've had the ability to save money and grow their investment and buy new things. Uh, I met an old chap who had his teeth done, who's now looking to buy a cow. I met a lady who accepts uh, Bitcoin in a shop when it was previously cash only, is now buying a car. So the, the premise of the uh, debate has already been proven false because Bitcoin is banking the unbanked already. I'd also just add in something else. Bitcoin doesn't only bank the unbanked, but it also rebanks those who are already banked. Uh, people who have access to certain financial services are, are gradually moving their financial services over to, to Bitcoin. So I would say myself, I'm personally in a transitionary phase. Uh, I've had bank accounts closed down. Now part of my banking is provided uh, on the Bitcoin network. Um, and I'm increasingly moving away from the traditional networks. This, this week, I've had Revolut, my personal bank, asking for a considerable amount of KYC AML information. And my account was actually locked for over a month, which meant I couldn't access certain financial services. Uh, I've had similar issues with bank, uh, uh, business banking, whereby Lloyd's TSB, my bank for 25 years, uh, closed down my accounts at six weeks notice uh, because they were run, running government surveillance and I refused to give them information I did not think that was uh, required for them to have. So again, I've, I'm gradually in this transition from traditional banking to neo banking to uh, Bitcoin banking. I expect at some point along this timeline, I will bank entirely on the Bitcoin network and won't be using the traditional networks, especially now as we have stable coins being created on Liquid and Lightning. So yes, the premise of the debate is uh, can Bitcoin bank the unbanked? It already is. So um, the debate has already been won. I'm not really sure what we're here to talk about. Oh, very brave. Very brave. I like that you led with your chin on that one, Peter. <laughs> well, let's uh, see what your opponent makes of that. And then, of course, we'll hear from our audience. And we are very keen to get your questions on this, whether you know a lot about it or whether you don't, which is one thing I certainly found with our, our last question crypto um, debate or, or debates was that a lot of people were coming from a high level and a lot and other people were simply confused but very curious and I'm absolutely open to questions uh, from both ends of the spectrum or indeed anyone in the middle but Yaya Fanuzi you've just been uh, issued quite a challenge there apparently this is all over I think it's all over well, it isn't now because Yaya is a senior fellow at the Center for New American Security. He's also host of the Rhythm of Wisdom podcast. He researches the national security implications of cryptocurrency and blockchain technology, spent seven years as an economic and counterterrorism analyst in the CIA, where briefing federal law enforcement and White House level policymakers included George W. Bush. Yaya, banking the unbanked, is it as simple or are there other elements that we ought to be bearing in mind from the upbeat account that we got from Peter? Thank you, Anne. Thank you, Peter. Great to be, be here with you. And let me, before I start, give a little bit of context because uh, many people may not know uh, my background uh, in terms of the crypto space. I actually do a lot of consulting with crypto uh, firms or, or firms that are sort of building crypto and blockchain applications. So this is not, uh, this is not a, a, a Nouriel Rubini sort of debate going on here. So from small scrappy startups to large major um, uh, tech firms that deal with crypto. Uh, but to get to the debate, uh, very interesting, Peter. I think I, I'll take this tack, which is that you know, crypto uh, for crypto to bank the unbanked. I think it's a pithy, well-meaning phrase, but it's based on a few unchecked assumptions uh, that make it a poor framing for how to solve the real problems of the unbanked. So I'm going to start with let's look at those three assumptions. The first unchecked assumption is that the primary cause of the unbanked is that banking as a service is sort of not within the reach, whether physically or lack of identity identification due to anti-money laundering, um, KYC, know your customer requirements. Um, but let's look at, let's look, sort of drill down, right? I actually looked at this issue with the Philippines uh, not too long ago because the Philippines has a huge unbanked population. And, and there was a study done uh, by the government which actually looked at the unbanked. There's about 50 some million people, adults without bank accounts in the Philippines, huge remittances, uh, remittance uh, uh, market. And out of those uh, 52 million adults, 60% cited not having enough money as the reason why they did not have a bank account. That was the chunk 
of uh, 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 that was the reason for right for the biggest chunk of people. And this was then followed by perceived lack of need, about 21%. And then the absence of documentation was about 18%. So what does that mean? It means that uh, the key reason uh, that folks are unbanked is simply not having enough money. The primary problem is an income problem. So you have an economic productivity problem, or maybe you frame it as an economic opportunity problem, but it's not a technological one. And so when you're also talking about participating in financial services, whether it is, you know, a, a rural farmer, whether it is Peter, who's, you know, is, you know, you know, in the Western world, but then wants to kind of get out of the, the, the traditional system, um, you're talking about having the surplus to participate in these financial services. You're not talking about being at a subsistence level, because if you're at a subsistence level, it's very difficult to find financial services. So that's really the issue. The problem is that when it comes to generating income or more wealth, there's no singular app for that. So it's really a tougher problem. The second unchecked assumption is that, you know, we're sort of talking about this idea of decentralized, more sort of pseudonymous um, finance, right? The second assumption is that this decentralized finance can scale to offer an alternative and maybe even better financial sector for the unbanked or underbanked. And here's the problem, because I deal with this a lot, because I deal a lot with the regulatory issues in the crypto space. The thing is that the pseudonymity, the fact that you know crypto is so open and anyone can download a wallet, anyone can transact, but the pseudonymity aspect actually means that it can only go so far. And let me tell you what I mean. Um, Unless, I hate to sort of be the buzzkill here, maybe, but until you sort of build that know your customer layer and that anti-money laundering layer into a financial service, you can't scale those enterprises. At least you can at least you can't sustain it. And what we're in right now is similar to the ICO phase, the initial coin offering phase in crypto, where you know what four or five years ago, lots of people were raising money because anyone could create a token. And now, hey, we're at a position where um, now we're at a position where regulators have caught up. So that's where we are. And the other thing is banking is evolving. So banking is not static. Banking is actually evolving, evol evolving to include crypto assets. And banking could include crypto assets, but still there's the AML KYC requirement. And then the third assumption that I'll end on is this. There's this undercurrent here that investing in crypto is a sufficient and comprehensive wealth strategy. Now, I'm not here to down investing in crypto or, or anything like that. But I'll end with this story. Do I have like a few seconds or did I go, did I, okay, yeah. So here's the story. 2018, I was out in Miami. I had been invited to speak to a group of bankers on in Miami Beach at the beach. This is really interesting. And I was talking about illicit, illicit risk in crypto. I did my little spiel and the audience of bankers. So I always ask who in the audience owns crypto? None of the bankers raised their hand, right? As you would expect. But guess who raised their hand? The wait staff the servers, the audio visual people, right? They all said, yeah, I own crypto. And you know, at the time I raised my hand as well. Afterwards, when I was done with my presentation, one of the AV guys came up to me and he said, he was like, you know, he wanted to get my advice. I guess he saw me as an expert. I wasn't you know, an expert per se. I was just talking about this, the space that I follow. And he said, hey, what do you think about this one token? And it was this token I had never heard of. I won't say the name, right? I don't wanna you know, make people angry. And so it was a token I had never heard of, but he was like, he was so caught up in like this one token. Do, do I think this is it? This was 2018 when the ICOs were really big. I took a look recently. I looked at that token and that token had ICOed at about 25 cents. That token is now worth about point zero point. It's about one cent. It's lost 94, 98% of its value since it ICO'd. This is not to down crypto in general or Bitcoin, but it's to say that there's this environment where people are looking for this quick solution and the low barrier to entry actually makes it easy for people to get scammed, for people to really be involved in a very risky environment. And who goes for that? The folks who are promised the idea of crypto as a quick way to wealth generation. Wealth generation is a lot more complicated. We have to be careful with people's money. So I'm gonna wrap up. There's so many other things that I love to say, but those three assumptions I think we need to check uh, because we, if we really want to solve the problem, it's not a technological one alone. Whew, you just made it. I was just about to. Uh, I was just going to come on with a big, a big, big hook, but you you packed a, a lot in there. I just say thank you very much. 
Um, we're already getting a load of questions, which I'm thrilled about. If you'd like to make my life easier, and I know that's really why you came along tonight, guys, and uh, and uh, all, all guys, guys of all sexes and genders, it, you could put things in Q&A. The chat gets very full and the chat is a bit hard to distinguish uh, someone just telling telling us off for something or telling me that, you know, I've hiccuped. Uh, but the Q&A is probably the best place to put your questions. You might get favoured a bit for your question if you're in the, the Q&A. Um, I feel, Peter, that you might have, a, uh, have some thoughts in return uh, on those factors. I mean, I'd just like to probe a bit on, on scale. I understood your point, that what we were arguing about, if you were already involved in a world where you felt that this was uh, working you could see it working you think it was working for you and and for a country you spend a lot of time in but the scalability issue did arise there and that's before we got to perhaps some of the other tripwires will you give us a, a couple of responses yeah so uh, some good points there and i'd like to respond i've tried to keep uh, as best notes as possible now, firstly I'll, I'll, I'll explain where i agree with the ia um i mean icos were dumb and stupid uh, I, I don't even compare them to bitcoin to me they the only similarity they have is some people learn to use a Bitcoin, uh, to use a blockchain to convince people of ideas and scam them into investing in things. Um, that's just a fact of life, whether it's the internet or, or people on the street. People have, there's a history of people scamming uh, others to try and make money from them, whether it's Ponzi schemes or M, uh, MLN schemes. But they really do have very little comparison to Bitcoin for me. And that's why my show is called What Bitcoin Did. I only focus on Bitcoin. And when people ask me to cover uh, any other alternative currencies or shit coins, I just ignore them because they have almost zero relevance to my life. Uh, and that's why I've said I'm going to focus on Bitcoin. Uh, and if we're talking about can crypto bank the unbanked, I'm going to talk about whether Bitcoin can bank the unbanked. Um, I think ICOs are absolutely nonsense and they have scammed people. I think it's very sad. Um, so let's talk about the uh, EIA's. Um, well, I, actually, do you know what? I'd like to start with just a little bit on EIA's background as a, as a CIA analyst and essentially a spook. I'm, I'm not surprised he's taken the counter position to this, but the CIA has a history of uh, many controversies trying to interfere in things and, and causing uh, many problems around the world, causing oppression, financial oppression, and uh, 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 numerous um, human rights violations. So I'm not surprised he takes the anti-position because uh, he, ha he has the belief that a, a centralized authority can make the world a better place. But I think there's many people who argue that the CIA has made the world a more dangerous and, and, and bad place. Now, if you talked about the situation in uh, Indonesia, the survey, I would want to see how the I would. You, you, I, yeah, sorry, uh, you, you might. I mean, uh, you might actually allow a, a response to that because I think that's a fairly, course, yeah. fairly personal point. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I hope we don't end up on a, a, a complete you know, going totally off off piece on, on this. But easy to the the charge seems to be putting aside that big ideological debate about the CIA that you kind of would say that, wouldn't you, because of other mm -hmm. elements of your belief system and the institutions mm -hmm. you've worked in. Interesting. Oh, well, he forgot to mention that um, in 2018, I, I taught a course, an intro to blockchain course for Morgan State University in Baltimore. Uh, for, actually, it was the first course, uh, we believe, the first course to teach blockchain, a formal course at an, uh, what we call a HBCU, a historically black college and university. Um, so, you know, if you, if the point is that I, I don't think everyone would say that I'm someone who uh, always wants to, wants to obey authority, but, uh, but, you know, it's well taken. I'm not here to debate or be a spokesperson for the Central Intelligence Agency. Um, that was a long time, a long time ago. So that's not the topic of the discussion. But if you want to know about me personally, yeah, I could definitely, I could, you know, I, you know how I have lots of actually um, former folks that worked under me, not in government, but who now work in the crypto space. Um, uh, folks that, uh, that I sort of helped introduce crypto to, or at least learned a lot with them. Um, so I don't think it's a valid issue to say because I work for the CIA, I can't have valid analysis about some of the risk uh, if we take a sort of uh, uh, uncautious approach to, to, to crypto. So well, should we should we consider that aspect dealt with? Because I think we could end up on this for for some time. But I think uh, Peter, you well, had to a, there, some, there, you did want to segue are, to another thought, didn't you? Well, there there is a there is a, a, a relevance to this point because the focus on uh, there was a focus when I mentioned uh, KYC and uh, the illicit use of Bitcoin or that's know your customer, isn't it? For those of us yeah, who yes. don't live in live in a world but, but, of uh, acronyms about this, until we turned up tonight. Go, go ahead. But the but the the problem with uh, KYC AML information is that it doesn't stop the problem; it moves the problem. So, enforcing uh, banks to 
carry out a surveillance on behalf of the government, what they do is they make banking a lot more expensive and a lot more difficult, and that's an invasion of privacy, but it doesn't stop criminals. Criminals just find other ways to move money. They don't turn around and say, do you know what? I don't know how to launder this money. I'm just going to have to go in the real world and get a proper job. Criminals just find alternative ways to move money and move value. Uh, so it just moves the problem and, and, and it causes, uh, it moves the problem, moves the cost onto the banks and the banks providing services to the individuals. Um, but the illicit use of cryptocurrencies is, a, is a fundamentally a false narrative. Uh, I think it was something like 2019, it was 2.3% of all crypto transactions were for illicit uses and by 2020 that dropped to 0.34 percent we don't have the figures for 2021 but my expectations it's dropped a lot lower so it is a false narrative um, and it's uh, it, these kind of ideas uh, trick people into thinking that bitcoin is used for things like money laundering uh, when i was here at the protests uh, in el salvador and speaking to the people who are against bitcoin there were lots of people perpetuating that uh, myth that bitcoin is used uh, primarily for money laundering so um, even, even so even if some criminals get use, get the use of the Bitcoin blockchain to commit criminal acts, I'm going to echo what Peter Van Valkenburg from the Coin Center said. For every one of those people who uses Bitcoin for illicit purposes, there is somebody who's using it for freedom, for economic freedom. Yeah, for every person who's using it to launder money, there's somebody supporting protesters in uh, 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 protests against Lukashenko's uh, dictator dictatorship who've decided to strike and they've received donations and they've re have liquidity in their country so they can survive and strike. So for every illicit use, there is a positive use and probably way more because it's 0.34%. So in terms of, um, so I'm just going back to um, his um, main argument is that it doesn't solve economic pro productivity. Again, this is, this is just a false narrative because I've seen it. I've seen it here in El Salvador. Um, let's talk about remittance only. Uh, firstly, I think it was today, I think it was Western Union claimed they're going to lose $400 million of business to uh, Bitcoin in El Salvador. That's $400 million that can go now into the pockets of people in the country rather than into the pockets of the people in uh, Western Union. So that puts more money into the economy here that can circulate. And if more money is in the uh, in the economy here circulating, that's going to lead to an increase in productivity and a demand of services. Secondly, by having an appreciating asset as opposed to a depreciating asset like the US dollar, remember, no stimulus checks reach the people of El Salvador as the US government continues to print more money. Jan uh, Janet Yellen claiming uh, uh, only this week that the debt ceiling will be hit mid-October. Therefore, there will need to be release of more funds trillions of dollars more to be printed. That's going to lead to inflation. We're seeing inflationary figures right now. Anything, depending on who you talk to, 5 to 10%, that is making the cost of goods more ex uh, expensive for people in El Salvador. So actually, these people being unbanked and, uh, and, not, and only having access to the dollar are actually lead, seeing, uh, seeing um, a decrease in productivity because they have to spend more, more money on importing goods. Now, by having just a, just to uh, conclude this point, and then I think we should go back over to yeah. You. Well, so just to say that that by having access to something like Bitcoin, they actually have access to something which is an appreciating asset. And what is this false narrative that people uh, can't don't have the money to um, to save? I asked the same question when I got here. One of the people I saw at the protest turned to me and says, "If I only have a hundred dollars, I have to spend that hundred dollars on food. I cannot afford to. I cannot afford Bitcoin." I went to Michael Peters in a Bitcoin beach who started the project here, and he said. I had a similar belief when I got here, but what actually happened is when people started holding Bitcoin, they realized every purchase they make is a decision. If they buy that can of Coke, if they buy that whatever, that T-shirt, that's something that may be worth more money in the future. So people have the ability to save, even on very low incomes, have the ability to save even a small amount, and they can see that appreciate in the future. So I just believe like EIA's uh, arguments are coming from a false narrative. Right. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, whether it's a, a false narrative or one you just happen to disagree with, yeah, you can pick up the, the <laughs> points that you feel that you want to yeah. nail before we go to Q&A, which is pretty busy, actually, Q&A. Yeah, There's also yeah. an entirely parallel chat going on <laughs> in my chat box. I get the feeling that a lot of people, sure. I get a lot of feeling that this is like, this subject <laughs> seems to attract people. Who, who, it's either a mixture of a kind of hate fest and a dating agency. So what I'm going to do <laughs> is focus their passions run higher on this than maybe I had realize so oh. i'm going to concentrate on q a and take questions from there uh, okay. i'm going to do that in a but in, in in fairness i think we should come back on anything you want to come back with and then we'll go yeah 
I'll just and I'll make it very quick. Uh, so I guess number one, it was interesting, Peter, because you mentioned the. I mean, you you basically said that um, that the, in in El Salvador, one of the good things has been that people have been convinced that. Uh, they've been convinced to pay as a use as a medium of exchange in appreciating asset so that that that's going to make them say, which is really kind of odd because you basically said that they're thinking about, oh, don't pay, don't pay for whatever groceries or, or some item because your Bitcoin could could uh, could uh, could go up. And, and that doesn't make it a good medium of exchange. But I'll leave that there. Um, hit the other two. That's things a completely said. separate point it, that, that you've, you've, you've confused two points. No. I'm just, well, no, I'm saying that's a point that you, it's okay. a fact, it's something that you said, which was interesting. No, as a, it, and I said, well, that's actually not good. <laughs> that's what I'm no, saying. No, you, you, it, you've it, misrepresented it, me. I, okay. Well, I think the audience will probably decide. Yeah, let people, let people, let people, yeah. Finish your point, then we'll go to the Yeah, let, 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 come on, guys. Should I not clarify the point? You can if you like to, but I'd like to hear what Gaia finishes briefly, and then you can clarify. It was a small point. It was a small point. We could forget that point, okay? I, but jury strike that from the record let's go on to other which what the other stuff you said illicit finance so i did an actual report in 2018 co-authored with uh, tom robinson who works with elliptic we actually did one of the probably the first survey of illicit finance and crypto yes we 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 uh, uh we assessed that the percentage of illicit crypto that you could identify was small um we could talk about the numbers but it was small but here's the real insight that we found we found that in the u.s and north america which had more aml regulation and more regulatory guidance in the crypto space compared to everywhere else in the world, especially Europe, that there was a much smaller percentage of illicit crypto in transactions moving through North American exchanges compared to exchanges where there were no, uh, where, you know, where you had no sort of AML regs. Lesson there is that it's actually important. Yes, of course, we know AML is not to stop money laundering or to prevent crime from happening. It's to sort of raise the cost and make it easier. And some people would say if it goes elsewhere, it makes it easier for law enforcement to identify the bad actors. The third point, which is about remittances, and I sort of frame this differently. Remittances is very important. I think we could argue and maybe debate how well crypto has taken off as a remittance substitute. People may mention it all the time, but I don't, I haven't really seen the, the, the data that says, you know, uh, uh, people are all shifting to crypto because it's much more easier and efficient. But here's one framing. I hate to say this, but hear me out. Remittances and improving remittances, while that's good, if we can make it more efficient, I want you to think of remittances as a first world problem. I know you're thinking, well, what do you mean? It helps the third world. Yeah. Improving remittances is a first world problem. What, why? Because what it does is, yes, it's making it on the, the back end in terms of improving the ability for people to send money. Where are they sending? They're sending from countries that have stable economies, much more, more, robust, e e uh, more, more robust economy, right? What it's not doing, it is not directly changing the economic productivity of the recipients. Now, yes, it allows them to get more money, but you're not shifting. You're not doing anything for what poverty alleviation needs, which is the economic activity. The only thing you could say is, well, now they have some extra money, so maybe they have extra money to do economic predict, predict, uh, uh, productive things. But you're not changing the economic landscape per se. You're really, it's really a, a problem of, of the sender who now maybe crypto can help with that sending, but it doesn't change, doesn't help us do the economic work that we, that we have to do in countries where we have large unbanked populations. I want to go over to q and I'm sure you have uh, thoughts to pick up on that, Peter, but uh, Q&A seems to be so bubbly tonight that you're bound to find something in there that you can, uh, can, can get into if you have things that you'd like to say along the way. Here's just a, I want to kick us off. It's anonymous, I fear, but you can tell us your names where you can. That's um, very nice. And we'll send both participants around afterwards to, to give you a cup of tea. Um, is evading helping someone to, sorry, is helping someone to evade KYC to get a Bitcoin wallet the same thing as banking them? It doesn't sound like the same thing. Peter. Mm. I need to think about the premise of the question because uh, mm. it sounds like a double, like a here means the question, is it helping somebody uh, perform illicit activity, but helping someone have a, a, a a crypto or a Bitcoin wallet to uh, evade the banking. Maybe somebody who's living in an authoritarian regime who wants to move money out of the country. It could be someone who has uh, a female, maybe within uh, the Middle East, within Muslim societies, where perhaps they're not allowed to. So the premise of the question mm. is, is is strange. I'd probably want more detail on that to, to understand exactly what they're asking. But you know, KYC AML laws are. 
EIA supports them, thinks they're very important, thinks they're very useful. I think they're oppressive and I think they move the problem. And I don't think they particularly solve it at the scale he thinks they do. Plus also, you've got a question, what is illicit? Is it illicit rules in the eyes of the government? The first time, one of the first times I bought so it depends on the buy, government, doesn't it? Yeah, well, it depends or on your... any, any power structure you happen to be living in. Um, well, do you want sorry, to come in on that? So, yeah, I... yeah, or we can move along. Sorry, Peter. Well, so I just thought it's important to finish the point is that um, somebody would say buying cannabis oil is an illicit activity is something which I've done, but that was to buy a treatment for my mother when she had cancer. So I think that it, some of this is, you know, how do you frame what is illicit activity? Did you want to come in on yeah. that one yet? Sure. This comes up a lot. And I think the way to think about it is that, um, you know, Peter's right that crypto actually has has shown a use in authoritarian governments and in situations where um, lack of freedom makes it difficult for people to purchase what they need to purchase or to speak their minds, etc. Um, the interesting point is, that's the problem. The problem is that there's a bigger issue here, right? That you're basically what you're saying is that crypto is helpful in a situation that should not exist, that there's a problem of authoritarian governments. There's a problem in a weakening economy where the, the, the currency is worth zero, you know, uh, you know, you know falls to, to zero or whatever that collapses, right? So you're basically saying the use case is to help in these situations which really should not be exist where there's a bigger either economic and political situation. Here's the thing I say as someone born and raised in the West. And it's really sort of shocking to me that so many of my you know, brothers and sisters from the US and from Europe, it's almost as if we 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 um, don't feel that other nations should have what we have. The key to actually what we have is not that we have a technology that keeps that allows us to operate pseudonymously or anonymously. That's not the key to our freedom. What's the key to our freedom is that we have accountability in our government, transparency. We have principles that uh, that, that the government is built upon. Accountability, checks and balances. It's not all uh, you know. It's not all liberty, and it's not all government surveillance. This is why this is not a simple issue. There's not a there's not an app for pol political and economic liberty and freedom. In fact, maybe the, what you could say is at the end of the day, we're, we, maybe we should figure out how do we help countries and nations become more um, economically free or less restrictive. Do you, in the long term, is a technological solution going to do that? Because we see what China is doing with the crypto space. Okay. It's cracking uh, down. Just, just a quick, wanna... quick, rem quick reminder, if you're getting as excited about this as our, our guests and uh, many of those attending, you can tweet using the hashtag uh, IQ2Crypto. Sorry, hashtag IQ2Crypto. I am steadily adapting to the 21st century. Hal Ive is asking, banking and finance have their own flaws and challenges, have they not? Is it believable that they will adapt as regulators do now, or as regulators do now crack down with scare propaganda and make transactions from banks, card companies, et cetera, more difficult for crypto enthusiasts? So, yeah, yeah, I'll start with you on that one. Yeah, I think because I sort of alluded to it, so maybe I'll take that. Uh, and the point, maybe I didn't flesh out enough, is that what I'm seeing as someone who consults with the crypto industry, who, yes, has a national security and anti-money laundering background, here's the thing that I'm noticing. I'm noticing that slowly but surely, a lot of the innovation that we're seeing in the crypto space Banks are, some banks are trying to, to regulate them. There are even some, you know, thought leaders in the traditional payment space that are basically saying that everything we have in banking should, should be on a blockchain and should be, uh, you know, we should figure out how to apply smart contracts to our financial services. And this is, even though we love, I mean, everybody loves I mean, this framing of David versus Goliath, right? It's the small crypto guy that's trying to overturn the banks. And yeah, I can criticize the banks because they don't want to innovate. But the key is, over time, what I'm noticing Seen. I'm seeing the steady march that those crypto players that are trying to build sort of on stable coins, trying to build this new ecosystem, here's the thing that they always come, they always come up against the wall where they realize they have to adapt. You just cannot have a scalable financial market or financial system that allows pseudonymity at scale. And the, here's, the, here's the drawback, and I'll end last with this point. Last point, I, I need to get yeah. through some questions. Come and on. the last point is that we always talk about the ease of, 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 virtual, of, of the frictionless. Here's the thing. Do you want an environment where someone can send a hundred million, a billion dollars with no friction to anyone that they can anonymously? That would unlock I mean, a whole types of illicit activity stuff that we don't even want to talk about if, if money was that frictionless with no checks and balances. I'm sorry. Peter. Well, we already have it. You can.
send a billion dollars uh, across Anonymous. the... Uh, uh, if, if if yeah, I mean, look, uh, achieving that is, is going to be difficult at you know at that kind of scale. Uh, but at the moment, you can send uh, money frictionless across the world, instant, near zero fees, uh, and have achieved final settlement, which is an amazing advancement in finance. Um, the walls have been built up by central banks and the banking sector itself. They've just harmed people. They've harmed people in this country where I'm in El Salvador, and they've harmed people even in the UK where I am. They make life more difficult all for the chasing, this very tiny percentage of illicit activity. Um, I, I, I understand where you're coming from. You, you're coming from the fear index of worrying about criminals and terrorists, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not. I'm coming from the opposite position of economic freedom and allowing trade and allowing people to move money around the world and not being held back by the banking system. I'm also coming from the position of people who see currencies devalue. You know, we've seen what happened in Venezuela and Zimbabwe. We're seeing what's happening in Lebanon this year. We've seen what's happening in Turkey. We're now seeing it happen in, in the United States. People deserve access to a money which isn't controlled by central banks, which isn't printed at a whim, which doesn't pay for the mistakes of government. And on top of that, you have permissionless censorship re resistant money that you can send anywhere in the world and achieve final settlement. Yes, th there will always be bad guys. That's that's a fact of life. But if you can bring economic freedom to the world, what's the net effect? I think the net effect of that is greater than what you lose by having the ability to track every single criminal in the world. Thank you. Um, that's admirably clear. Uh, we've got a number of questions in the same sort of zone for, for both of you. So I'll go back to Yaya, which is along the lines of, well, this uh, El Salvador is a relatively small scale example. It has particular social, economic, political um, context there. Uh, someone says, so actually, this one's a, is a question to Peter, but I think there's a, a balancing one, which is how much of that 400 million will actually end up in the pockets of the poor, uh, all of Bitcoin ATMs and wallets hosted on Amazon uh, being provided for free. The sort of balancing question somewhere high up in the Q&A was along the, the lines of, well, if El Salvador failed, if that experiment went south, would we have to accept that it was it's an experiment that we take seriously and there's a flaw uh, in this unbanked uh, crypto unbanked argument because it had failed or would you simply say well that's that just happened because of particular circumstances and there was another question along the same lines that said where does Cardano in Ethiopia play into this um, I think we're going back to Yaya um, I think we have to be very careful with the cavalier attitude of experimenting with people's money Again, I'm not trying to be the, 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 cold, the cold water guy. If El Salvador, I mean, I guess we have to talk about El Salvador and Peter is on the ground. Peter, I'll give you my critique or my, not critique, my concern. Um, again, as someone who lives in a place of representative government and government accountability, it's troubling or it, it, it's concerning that even if it's an innovative way of dealing with the currency crisis and the money crisis, it's concerning that appears that this experiment has sort of been pushed, pushed through without a really big consultative process, consultative process or strong buy-in even from most of the business community. I think I saw the Wall Street Journal um, had a, a report where they talked about El Salvador's Chamber of Commerce that 90 some percent of the business or at least the members of the Chamber of Commerce did not um, did not support this move to to, to Bitcoin or yeah, to, to Bitcoin. And I think those of us again in, in the West, how would we feel about you know one politician getting inspired, pushing through something that would be so radical and risky? Again, not saying I don't appreciate crypto. I do. I've taught, I've taught about the importance of crypto and decentralized apps. But the issue is the consultative process. Um, I think that's really a big concern. And, and it could go wrong, not to be a fear guy, but come on, would we stand for this in the UK or in the United States? Well, you've moved into politics here. And these are the only questions that should be asked to President Bukele and, and why he made those decisions. Um, the, the, the political decision that he's taken has uh, almost zero to do with what Bitcoin itself can achieve. So I think we should separate the two. I, I, I'll happily ask those questions to Bikaley, but they're about his uh, they're about his administration, the decisions they've made. That itself is a distraction from the point of what Bitcoin can do. Now, if you want to talk about Bitcoin as an experiment, it's an experiment that's nearly 13 years old. And we could talk about fiat currencies. They are also an experiment. But I think it's, uh, I think it's hard to argue that uh, Bitcoin has been a far greater success than fiat, than fiat currencies. Fiat currencies have led to the collapse of 
countries. They've led to the decimations of people's savings. And they've also been used to launder money around the world by criminals. Bitcoin itself has actually led to people being able to appreciate values given economic freedom, given, given economic, economic opportunity. As a 13-year project, which came out of nowhere, to me, it is an absolute roaring success compared to the absolute failures by central banks. And just on the point of Cardano, Cardano is a shit coin. And what's been done in Ethiopia there is close to a scam. I don't support it in any way. It's selling people a technology they absolutely don't need. Right. Okay, that's not going in their advertising campaign anytime soon, is it? Okay, nope. here we have um, a, a question, which is a, a broad one, and then something that perhaps follows from it. I've decided it does. You can tell me I'm wrong. Is the financial system outside sovereign control even possible? I suppose the reason I, my mind went, went there was I, I take uh, Peter's points, but obviously you, you simply cannot compare the scale of what fiat currencies and central banks are, uh, are trying to do in the world uh, as, against something which is, is an emerging cryptocurrency. So I suppose the question would be, in the long run, do you always inevitably get back to sovereign or state control? Uh, it just may take a, a longer way. Uh, you may have actually rather different views on this. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. The demise, the, the um, how, how should I say it? The uh, the new the the demise of the uh, nation state has been um, widely uh, exaggerated. I know we talk we talk about this this world of you know the, the, there should be no uh, the nation state is not necessary and it's called done more harm than good. Um, I think that's overstated. I, I say that because you know my my, my point um, you know my point is that in my study experience, yeah, I've come to this conclusion that you know if you do want to scale and this is working with some of the innovators in the ind industry right when i advise them i understand their desire to create a freer more permissionless system of transacting i understand i think it's noble i think there's there's room for it but i also understand that you know Again, we're talking about money. Money is different than other technologies. You know, people will say, well, code is speech. You can't regulate the speech. Eh, but we're talking about value, right? You can't have it both ways, crypto folks. You can't say that this is value. This is a digitizing value, revolutionizing value, and then just say, well, it's speech and you can't regulate it because it's just code. You can't have both ways. Because the, the, ch the challenge is when you, talked about, when you talk about value, the world from different nations, more authoritarian to democratic, all have come to the conclusion that you have to regulate finance. You have to regulate value because they, not Yaya, not the CIA, not, not some bureaucrat, people are comfortable with the idea that they are going to give the government power to re regulate up to a point finance. We can't escape it just because, yeah, now I can create a token, I, cre I can create a protocol, but you're gonna hit a ceiling. I'm sorry to say it's it's not like I'm happy. It's like I'm trying to, you know, but that, that's that's the sort of rational conclusion you come to when you try to scale these protocols. Peter, fair point. Uh, yeah, and, and I'm with you. I'm not an anarcho-capitalist. I don't uh, I don't in the certainly in the short term see a fall of the nation state. Uh, but I do see a world where Bitcoin can bring more accountability to the nation state. And I do see a world where the, the state becomes more of a service provider and uh, as they have restrictions placed on the income they can derive uh, from uh, from the, the population. Now, I, I would just say, look, if you look at uh, central banks policies, they continually print and uh, debase currencies because you have a group of guys in a room making decisions that tr they're trying to balance an economy. Let's look at it a different way. Bitcoin is entirely different. It's monetary policy is essentially two rules. It's a fixed limit currency of 21 million coins, which has an issuance rate, which halves every four years. Now, what happens is everybody understands those rules and have to, everyone has to play by those rules and adapt to it. That to me is a far fairer and better world than one which is where the money is governed by a few guys in a room making decisions which are influenced by lobbyists and their friends, et cetera. So yeah, listen, look, what world do you want to live in? Do you want to live in the world where, of, let's, let's look at both extremes. We have China on one end, CBDCs. We're seeing the growth of uh, uh, authoritarianism across the world. So we have China with its social credit scores, CBDCs, where they can control your money, penalize you and take your money for you if you don't follow their strict guidance on how to behave in their conformed society. Or do you want a freer world where you have access to financial services, whoever you are? Nobody can steal your money. Nobody can take it from you. And everybody has the opportunity to save, spend, and send that money where you want. I know which side I, which side I would go for. 
I'm going to actually stay with you, then flip back to you, because I thought this one uh, would be a nice one for you guys to sort of in the finish round of this, and then you get to do your up some, and we'll see how the voting is looking. Money is important, as is banking. What are the positive arguments for moving them beyond democratic control? Peter, and then back to you. I'm just trying to think. I'm trying to think what the question means. I think you say means, that again. Actually, I'll, I'll do it again. Money is important. Mm -hmm. I think we can all agree on that. What are the positive arguments for moving money and banking beyond democratic control? So I suppose it's flipping that way of looking at the sovereignty the and the state or the central bank standing behind currencies, fiat currencies, and saying, uh, if you, I mean, if you don't, if it's not a question you think you can answer or engages you, I think it's fine to move on. I just it intrigued me. I think I, I, I think that it's trying to ask why would you have a decentralized currency over one which is well, I think I think that's state. what it means, isn't it? Yeah, but, I mean, yeah, I've, I've, mean, I've I, gone for the, the Mrs. Merton kind of generalist view of this question. Well, I, I just think I think the free market for money will decide. And I think we're living in a, a, a stage where we have sovereign currencies and we have Bitcoin, and you have a choice to hold your wealth in whichever you choose. I've moved pretty much all of my money now into Bitcoin, like ninety percent, and I'm only using banks for uh, wow. for the ability to pay for certain things like paying staff or paying uh, for my mortgage or car payments, the things they have to do through the traditional banking system. I've done that because I get to control my money. I get to manage the security. I get to manage my privacy and I get to store my wealth in a way that I want. And that to me is the kind of world I want to live in. And everyone else can vote with their feet or vote with their money. You can choose to hold your local sovereign currency or you can choose to hold uh, Bitcoin. The free market will decide which money people want. And I've got a feeling Bitcoin is going to continue to grow as sovereign currencies fail, as we see seen in Lebanon, as we're seeing in Turkey, as we're seeing in the United States. Governments are trying to print themselves out of their own errors because governments got too big. And I think this is going to regulate governments. It's going to shrink the size of government. I think that's a great thing. And yeah, yeah, yeah some thoughts from you there, and then we'll yeah. come to concluding arguments. Yeah, just real quick. I mean, I think our con that's a good question, but I think our conversation has veered off into more an ideological discussion about, you know, about crypto, which is not okay, bring what it the bring it back home then. Yeah, the, the question is about, yeah, okay, let's say of Bitcoin, but the question is about can Bitcoin bank the unbanked? And, you know, uh, what is the the value? I mean, what Peter, I think what you just mentioned is that you the way I read what you said is that you you have the luxuries to choose Bitcoin. And I'm not against that. I think people should choose bit, whether it's Bitcoin or sovereign currency. No one is no one is uh, negating that. I'm trying to answer the question about does the presence or or maybe the push for let's say Bitcoin is Bitcoin what the unbanked and the poorest of the poor need? Because when you really talk about the unbanked, it's the poorest of the poor. And my my stance is that that's not enough, and that's probably that shouldn't be the focus. Right. Well, we're coming to. Uh final vote but you do get two minutes to uh, to up some i think what we do is uh, do we start voting no no we don't we need to hear the summaries first in case there's a breakthrough moment and a big swing in those undecideds you get two minutes each and i think this time we start with yeah if there's anything that you feel perhaps that the other side brought up this might be a good time mm -hmm. to to wrap that in a, a couple of minutes crypto can bank the unbanked go yeah yeah yeah, maybe some things I should have said at the top, you know, because, you know, people hear CIA, they see, they hear those three letters. And of course, sounds like they prejudge you. Sounds like they think they know about you because you worked for the Central Intelligence Agency. Uh, wow. Zimbabwe, I've been to Zimbabwe. My college thesis was a comparison of rural development in Zimbabwe and comparing that with community development of youth in inner city United States. And I spent six weeks in Zimbabwe. Now this was, I'm older than I look, this was in the mid nineties. Um, and I spent time in a local rural village with no electricity. And I saw that the biggest thing that this one uh, organization was doing is it was helping these youth who had left school um, um, generate income. It was a youth, it was a carpentry group that was generating income in rural Cholocho uh, in, in Matebele land, Zimbabwe. And uh, I'm not from Zimbabwe, but I just remember that. And that was where I first sort of learned that. And then I spent, I, was, I did a Fulbright in Ghana uh, after college uh, on teachers in rural 
rural um, incentives for teachers in remote areas. I spent a lot of time in northern Ghana. Um, and so, and, and before I joined the CIA, guess where I worked? I worked in inner city DC. I was a math teacher for three years. This is all in my record. People, people who know me know this. So I've sort of been connected to, you know, community development, the rural development, et cetera. I'll end with this because I, I know I gave a lot of facts. Here is my anecdote. <laughs> my anecdote is I've never gone viral. I'm not a viral guy. I, I, I'm not on social media a whole lot. The closest I've gone to viral was this article I wrote uh, at the beginning of January called Stop Saying You Want to Bank the Unbanked. Shout out to Forbes. It was, it was in Forbes. And that article, I think, is why I'm here. That article was recirculated mostly on LinkedIn about three, four months ago. And I kept getting all these um, messages from people in rural development, community development, and microfinance. I know this is anecdotal, but I just want to say- You need to just cut to the end of it as well, because it's two minutes. the ending is most people said that what I was saying reflected what they're seeing on the ground, that even though they're doing microfinance and trying to help people, the unbanked, they need to generate income. That's the number one thing. And it's not necessarily a technological solution. Okay, thank you very much, Peter. Last couple of minutes to you. And uh, then stay with us, guys, because uh, we're going to go for the vote. Yeah, I, I think I think on reflection, the premise of the debate is wrong, because I don't think Yaya disagrees that Bitcoin can bank the unbanked, but I think it's hard to argue about against the fact that people are able to access banking services using apps built on the Bitcoin network. I think the premise of the debate probably should have been, can Bitcoin create economic opportunity, increase productivity? I think that would have been a much better question. We could have debated it. And, and, and I would still have taken the side that, yes, it can, because really what we're discussing is, do you want an appreciating asset versus a depreciating asset? An appreciating asset being held increases the purchasing power of the individual. So that increases productivity within a country because people have higher spending power. Also, having the technology to receive and send payments in places that haven't had it before, again, increases productivity. I'll give one example. This week, I visited in El Salvador a facility which helps uh, people with addictions get off the streets. Okay, uh, it's a small facility that survives on a budget of $40,000 a year. I reached out to the Bitcoin community and we've raised this same facility to be around $140,000 in uh, Bitcoin. That money now comes in across the Bitcoin network into this country. Some of it gets spent as Bitcoin to Bitcoin, some gets converted to dollars. But that is increasing the amount of money that's in the country and that's increasing productivity. Only this week they're out buying uh, uh, um, the products to improve the facility. Actually, they're moving to a new facility. Uh, they're buying beds, they're buying materials to improve the facility. So if you increase the flow of money with an appreciating asset, of course it increases the productivity and economic opportunity of the people there. And the thing is, I've seen it. I've been coming here for two years. This is my sixth time here. I've seen the changes to this small town in El Zonte. I've seen the infrastructure that's been built. I've seen the people coming in. So uh, I think the premise was wrong. And I also think on both points, yeah, I would be wrong. Right. Now, inconveniently for Peter, we're going to vote on the premise that he thinks is wrong, oh, but I we did also you. talk about it. So uh, crypto can bank the unbanked. It's time for Pam, your... I can't oh. hear you. She, she's okay. I hear her. Maybe it's your oh. audio, Peter. Can you hear me? Uh, okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for that heads up. But no, I, I think I, I'm afraid I think it's you might be your audio, Peter. Here we go. Yeah. Uh, crypto can bank the unbanked. Here is a poll appearing on your screen. And I think by the quality of the questions, you're very bright and can tell that four against and undecided means four against or undecided. I'm sorry, Peter, if you've lost sound. I, I fear if you can hear me, it may be at your end. Let's hope we get you, you back. Um, so we'll get your voting, please. Four against undecided on the motion. While we're waiting for that to come in, I'd like to remind you, this is the third debate in the Intelligence Squared crypto series. If you've enjoyed it, we hope you have, you can catch up on the first two. They were Bitcoin versus gold with Anthony Scaramucci and Peter Schiff, equally as passionate as the debate you've heard tonight, and Crypto versus the Environment with Lynn Alden and Alex DeVries on the Intelligence Squared podcast and YouTube channel. But now it is time, I hope, to reveal the results. And the first vote, to remind ourselves, was 49% against, 15 undecided, Sorry, I'm so utter rubbish. I'll start again. First vote was 49 for, 15 against, undecided 36. The second vote is for 
against 27% and undecided 14%. So that was a big, big swing there from the undecideds to for the motion, for the motion carries it 59%, 27 against, and immediately 14% undecided after that firefight. Uh, thank you very much for doing battle for us tonight.